Every town has a dark side. Today, we're heading to Cache Creek Regional Park, which is in Yolo County, California, where we learn about Rico Harris and the baffling disappearance of a basketball player. Ballin' for life. These words and a basketball are permanently inked on the left arm of a man whose lifelong passion and dream revolved around making it big in the NBA. But since 2014, the same tattooed phrase has become a distinct mark that can lead to the discovery of Rico Omar Harris, who mysteriously vanished in the autumn of 2014 in California. How could a six foot, eight inch tall, 280 pound former player of the world famous Harlem Globetrotters team just go missing unnoticed? It's a question that has lingered for the past seven years despite extensive search efforts. But only Rico, the gentle giant basketball prodigy, knows the exact answers which the world may never find out. Hi, I'm Andrew Fitzgerald, bringing you another mind-boggling story of disappearance in this week's episode of Everytown. In the hoops world, 37-year-old Rico Harris was a celebrity in his own right as a star player since his athletic days back in high school. His biggest dream was derailed by an unexpected mishap, and as he was about to get a second lease on life, Rico vanished under questionable circumstances. His entire story is full of mysteries, and while he's been missing for almost a decade now, his loved ones, hope and finding him, still marches on. Life can be mysteriously unkind, Enrico Harris endured such a fate. His traumatic childhood was marked by his father's abuse and his young adult years were peppered with trouble. And yet, through all the personal lows and struggles, Rico was steadfast on becoming a successful professional basketball player in the mold of his idol, Magic Johnson. And for one noble reason, to give his mother and siblings a really good life that they deserve. Rico probably took after his love for basketball from his father, Henry Harris, a star forward for Idaho State University back in the mid-70s. Henry met Rico's then 17-year-old mother, Margaret Fernandez, when he was in Los Angeles playing in a semi-professional league. She soon became pregnant and gave birth to Rico on May 19, 1977. Within a year, they moved to Oregon, where Henry had a job offer. But the couple's relationship was a combustible mix of passion and violence, in which Henry would occasionally inflict verbal and physical abuse on Margaret. The Harris family went back to Los Angeles and had three more children who weren't spared from Henry's wrath. They were all mistreated. The entire family was mistreated, but Rico, being the oldest, got it the worst. Margaret eventually ended the relationship for good and then moved with her four children to her hometown in Alhambra, a suburb in Los Angeles. Together, they cramped in a tiny two-bedroom duplex. And as a single mom, Margaret struggled with a full-time job, and she considered Rico as the glue that held the family together. She said, I don't know how my kid has so many qualities me and his dad don't have. Patient, loving, super enthusiastic. Early on, Margaret knew her son was born to play basketball, 
with his towering height and having a father who was a collegiate basketball player himself, Rico seemed destined to tread the same path and become great. Growing up, Rico was known for being gentle, soft-spoken, and shy, always displaying a smiling face, easy to like and incredibly hardworking, and he saw his life as something that he could use to help his family. He towered over other children on the playground at Alhambra's Fremont Elementary School. He likewise joined pickup basketball games with adults at the Granada Park Gym by age 11. No one doubted his talent, and Rico only wanted to create a better life for his family through basketball. And, really, fulfilling the dream seemed inevitable for the 15 year old, who was 6 foot 8, 215 pounds at the time with an uncanny ability to shoot hoops. In order to pursue his dream, he then switched high schools and joined Temple City High School's basketball team. Rico only played two years there, but his talent was truly immense and exceptional. So much so that he turned Temple City High, which was previously undistinguished in the competitive prep basketball landscape, into a must-see destination for scouts and basketball aficionados. At Temple City, Rico was seen as a star player, so he avoided drugs and alcohol. Shy and withdrawn, he struggled academically and only snuck out of his shell on the basketball court. That changed a bit, though, when Rico met Melinda Young a radiant brunette whose academically inclined family helped him with his studies. The inspired basketball star improved both socially and academically after that, achieving a 3.0 grade point average, while also averaging 28 points and 15 rebounds a game during his senior season. He was recognized by the Long Beach Press-Telegram was one of the best high school players in the Western United States during the 1994-95 season, along with Chauncey Billups, Paul Pierce, and Jason Terry, all of whom went on to have long careers in the NBA. Rico attracted big-time coaches, including Jim Herrick, who had spent decades as a college and university basketball coach. He wanted to recruit Rico to be part of a powerful team for the University of Rhode Island with Zach Marbury and Lamar Odom. Sadly though, Rico didn't do well at the scholastic aptitude test and the scholarship offer went kaput. But the highly skilled amateur basketball player had many options that offered new opportunities and environments. And they also opened Rico's vulnerabilities which ultimately did more harm than good in the long run. After high school, Rico attended Arizona State University under Proposition 48 which limited him to taking classes during his freshman year in order to regain his eligibility. He had the opportunity to play for several Division I basketball programs, but never did due to the academic and personal setbacks. Without his family and friends close by, he again struggled academically and socially. In March of 1996, he was then arrested on a charge of unlawful imprisonment along with two teammates. See, they were accused of holding two women against their will and forcing them to perform sexual acts. While all three were arrested, Rico was the only one not accused of the more serious charge of sexual assault. 
All charges, ultimately, were later dropped when investigators uncovered inconsistencies in the women's stories. Nonetheless, though, ASU officials asked Rico to sit out another basketball season, but he refused. Deeply embarrassed, he returned home to be close to his mom and girlfriend, Melinda, and that's when he enrolled at Los Angeles City College, a two-year community college with a renewed focus and hope for a fresh start. He hoped to improve his academic performance and once again become eligible to play for the University of Rhode Island under Coach Herrick. And Rico amazingly delivered the goods for LACC. He was the team's biggest star, averaging 16 and a half points and 14 rebounds a game. All this culminated during the 1996-97 season when LACC won its first ever California Community College Athletic Association state title, and Rico was the unanimous championship tournament MVP. When he seemed ripe to play for Rhode Island, Rico lost the opportunity again when he failed in a psychology class due to excessive absences. Speculation arose that he had deliberately failed the class to avoid having to relocate to the East Coast, far away from his hometown. Thus, Rico reluctantly returned to LACC for a second season, which he later admitted was a mistake. During this time, he became less focused and more vulnerable to his vices. He and his brother Tito partied and drank heavily, even during the daytime, but it didn't seem to affect his performance on the basketball court. LACC failed a back-to-back win, and Rico was described as a disruptive influence during that season. As a consequence of his increasing drinking sprees, he was suspended for six games, got alienated from his friends and teammates, and then broke up with his girlfriend, Melinda. Moreover, Rico ignored recruiters from other four-year college programs interested in him, believing that they only wanted him for his athletic ability and not his personal development. Instead, he then applied for the 1998 NBA draft. Scouts thought so highly of him that he was invited to the premier pre-draft camp in Chicago. But a few days before it started, Rico withdrew because he felt he wasn't ready. So it was back to school, and when everybody thought that he'd finally be joining Rhode Island, Rico sprung a surprise by joining California State University. It came as a shock because there had never been a player of Rico's caliber, a potential NBA power forward who had considered enrolling at a small state school which hadn't posted a winning record at all. Hopes were high, but Rico sadly fell short of the expectations. As he continued heavily drinking, and having underlying emotional difficulties, especially his failed attempts to reconcile with his father, which ultimately got the better of him. He got suspended a few times, and a contusion in his pelvis sidelined him for five games. Many observers, including his previous coaches, felt that Rico was sabotaging his own NBA prospects as the team scout saw his downward turn and eventually stopped altogether coming to his games. His name was all but gone from their list of potential draft picks. Rico would never play college basketball again after that, and he left California State in Northridge shortly after the season's end. Sounds like Rico's world halted, but... As the cliché goes, when a door closes, another one opens. In 
The NBA dream for Rico Harris seemed almost lost forever as he dabbled shortly in the International Basketball League while sobering up and perfecting his jump shot. Then in the spring of 2000, an opportunity to be a part of the American Exhibition basketball team, the Harlem Globetrotters, came his way. It wasn't big time NBA, but it suited his skills, and Rico soon found his niche. But then, just a month after warming up the Globetrotters, Rico figured into a mishap. He and his girlfriend were driving in South Los Angeles when he got into trouble with a group of strangers. As he was about to confront them, Rico was hit by a baseball bat in the back of his head. It resulted in a persistent head injury that caused intense headaches and an imbalance. Rico, who was then 24 years old, had to leave the Globetrotters. It was his last opportunity ever to play basketball, and so Rico returned to his mother in Alhambra. Jobless and hopeless, Rico found solace in alcohol and was aggravated by succumbing to his other demon, an addiction to heroin, methamphetamine, and crack. He, like his siblings, who were also battling substance abuse, became an added burden to his mother, who could only hope her eldest son would snap out of his addictions. She did her best to make both ends meet, working as a caregiver for the elderly, but Rico worsened throughout the 2000s. Without basketball, he had lost his sense of self and was left with only these raw, bitter emotions he'd long repressed. Not only was he not helping his family, but now he was harming them. From 2001 to 2007, Rico faced numerous cases before the L.A. County Superior Court. Everything that ranged from public intoxication to burglary to even trespassing. After a few days in jail... He often resumed drinking, and in order to support his habits, he would sometimes beg on the streets. His childhood friend, David Lara, witnessed them all, saying, It was despair. It was down there. It was the darkest of the dark. Efforts to dissuade him from treading this destructive path seemed to have worked in 2007. Turning 30, Rico started a change after experiencing an overdose of prescription medications. Thanks to the long, arduous, but successful program offered by the Salvation Army's Adult Rehabilitation Facility in downtown Los Angeles, Rico seemed to have recovered after finishing the program. He wanted to turn over a new leaf and rebuild his life. He then worked at the Salvation Army soup kitchen to help prepare the meals for the clinic's hundreds of patients, making him feel needed and giving him a purpose. Rigo made amends and mentored others and soon volunteered at a shelter himself. When he finally finished the program, he got a job in the nearby city of Bell working long hours on security detail. Then, one evening at a party, Rico met 34-year-old insurance broker Jennifer Song from Seattle. The two hit it off immediately, and soon a romance blossomed. Starting in 2012, they began spending long weekends in each other's city, And by September of 2014, they entertained the prospects of getting married. Shortly after this, Rico moved in with Jennifer in Seattle, and the thought of relocating there permanently wasn't far-fetched in his mind. They shared a Facebook page, credit cards, and a bank account. 
However, they were having a few arguments in the days after he first arrived. But still, it must have been true love that persuaded the now 37-year-old Rico to pursue his plan of marrying Jennifer and living with her in Seattle. He went on and exchanged his California driver's license for a Washington one. He also secured a job interview for a property appraiser position, a job he valued as it would have been the first time he'd pursued a career far different from playing basketball. He saw it as a chance to be respected for his brains and not brawn. It dawned on Rico that before he would start a new phase in his life, he wanted to come clean by reconciling with his past. So he drove 1,100 miles to Alhambra from Seattle to visit his mother and closest brother and find closure about lingering family issues. Jennifer said, I think he realized some things and he wanted to talk to her. He wanted her to trust him and trust us and believe in our relationship. On the way to Alhambra, Rico called up his childhood pal, David Lara, and told him he wanted to have a family and kids. Rico then arrived in his hometown at 2 a.m. on October 9th he stayed there briefly. He took his brother to dinner the following night, gave him a new cell phone, and then spoke to his mother alone. Perhaps he was hoping to cut the cord from his youth, but when he left, he didn't seem to be a man who had exercised any past demons. His mother said, The last conversation with me, He wasn't in a good place, and he had to clear his mind. At 10.30 p.m., Margaret suggested that Rico lay down for bed before heading back to Seattle the next day. However, wanting to be back in Seattle for the job interview and a barbecue dinner with Jennifer's neighbors the next day, Rico left Alhambra before midnight on October 9th, driving north of Interstate 5. By 1 a.m. on October 10th, he contacted Jennifer while driving, and they chatted for three to four hours, during which Jennifer grew concerned of Rico's state of mind, as he'd been awake for nearly 40 hours by that time. Jennifer called up Rico when she woke up at 8 a.m., and learned that he was near Sacramento, fueling up. After making a wrong turn, Rico corrected himself and passed north through Sacramento, eventually curling onto Route 16 until he was enveloped by the Capay Hills. When the sun reached its apex, he found a rest stop and finally pulled over. Meanwhile, Margaret and Jennifer both kept checking in on Rico, but they didn't receive an answer. By 10.44 a.m., Rico texted Jennifer to apologize for missing her call and left a message saying that he was going up into the mountains to rest, since he hadn't slept much since leaving Seattle. Jennifer tried to stay calm, but still found herself worrying. At 11.15 a.m., Rico turned off his phone, so Jennifer's numerous calls went unanswered. Since October 10th, 2014, no one has heard from Rico, and the gentle giant appears to have vanished into thin air. An incident of a disappearing Rico had actually happened in the past when he was gone for a few hours in San Diego, California. So Jennifer and Margaret decided to wait and see if he would return on his own, but Rico didn't. On October 14th, they reported him missing to the Alhambra police and an investigation ensued immediately. That afternoon, 
a Yolo County deputy sheriff patrolling along a stretch of California State Route 16 along Cache Creek, which was north of Rumsey, once again saw a black Nissan Maxima sedan at the Yolo County Regional Parks lot, which he had spotted the day before. The car's battery was dead and the gas tank empty. He looked inside and saw CDs, credit cards, and various papers scattered about. Upon checking, he learned that the car hadn't been reported stolen. The Alhambra police later identified that this car was registered to Rico Harris, so they informed a shocked Margaret that it had been found, but without her son. Not long after authorities found Rico's vehicle, a family returning from Sacramento noticed a dead but undamaged cell phone on the pavement next to the road about a mile south of the park. Leaning against the guardrail next to the phone was a black backpack containing jumper cables, a few pieces of clothing, and two bottles filled with alcohol and energy drinks. This family told Sergeant Dean Nyland, the lead detective in the case, that they searched without success for an owner. They were Rico's, as the phone contained pictures of the creek and some selfies, including one in which Rico is standing playfully in front of a sign welcoming drivers to Yolo County. Also, a recent video unintentionally recorded on the cell phone showed Rico sitting in the car with the camera facing the dome light. Music blared as Rico tore through papers in the glove box and flung them around. His wallet and its contents landed in the back seat amid the mess of papers, Thus, a search of the surrounding terrain of Cache Creek Canyon began using all-terrain vehicles and helicopters. An airplane with a thermographic camera flew over the area and search dogs were brought in as well. They covered the area within a five-mile radius of that parking lot, as well as the 27 miles of Route 16 that ran through the canyon. Strangely, there was no sighting of the six foot eight ex basketball player. Authorities couldn't imagine how such a big person could disappear so completely. But a glimmer of hope was provided by people who allegedly saw Rico at different times after he vanished on October 10th. Three witnesses claimed to have seen a tall, African-American male resembling Rico on October 12th. The first spotted him sitting on a guardrail overlooking the creek near the parking lot. A second saw him walking southbound on Highway 16, and a couple saw him walking around a black car seemingly confused. The supposed sighting supported the speculation that Rico had hitchhiked out of the area. On October 19th, a witness reported he'd seen a large individual wearing light-colored pants of a similar hue to the ones that Rico had been wearing when he left Alhambra, walking on a cattle guard near the bushes at the parking lot in Lower Sight on October 11th. When searched, additional fresh footprints left by size 18 sneakers consistent with those Rico wore were found leading from the parking lot to the creek near where his car had been parked. Investigators surmised Rico must have returned to grab his belongings, but were unsure as to where he could have gone. In mid-November, cadaver dogs were then sent into the woodland area near Lower Sight, and professional divers checked the sinkholes in the creek. After a full weekend, again they found nothing, and Rico Harris had been missing for six weeks by then, with barely a trace. (laughs) 
Detective Dean Nyland has ruled out the possibility of foul play or robbery in Rico Harris's disappearance. His phone's photo and video content suggested he came to Yolo County voluntarily and alone. There wasn't evidence of any kind of a struggle. He presumed Rico may have left his backpack and phone either accidentally or purposefully to avoid being tracked via the phone. It's also plausible that Rico found solace in the hills of Yolo County, felt like a free man, and decided not to proceed to Seattle just yet. After wandering the area for a few days, Rico returned to his car and found it gone, and Detective Nyland speculated that at that point, he either walked away into the woods or towards another town. But what happened after that? It seems like a dead end, but not for Rico's dear mom, for whom he dreamt of building a better life through his talent in playing basketball. Rico, you are not forgotten ever. I am not giving up on finding my son. A grieving yet hopeful Margaret said. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Every Town. If you're interested in even more creepy videos, then head over to our Patreon page, because over there we have an entire catalog of videos that are too dark to be available on our regular channel. Plus, there's tons of other perks as well, so go check it out at patreon.com slash scary mysteries. And that's it for this week's episode of Every Town. Tune in next week for another one filled with scary, strange, and mysterious stories. Because who knows, maybe your town will be next.